everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of the Dollar Bin Band. It's the only podcast where old friends discuss old comics and the people that created them. I'm Joe Marcello, joined as always by my partner in crime, Oren Phillips. And today we are thrilled to have a third member of the Dollar Bin Bandits team, Michael Farah. Mike, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of the team. Hey guys, very excited to be here. Very excited uh, that we're adding podcasting to the format. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to hear from uh, all the creators you guys have interviewed and really participate myself. It's going to be a good time. Now, in a moment, you're going to hear our first podcast uh, with Paul Levitz. Now, Paul Levitz has had a 35-year career at DC Comics alone. Uh, he moved his way up the ladder, starting as just a writer and ending up as president. Uh, he oversaw many of the major storylines of the 90s, uh, and one that's near and dear to me, The Death of Superman. Yeah, when I found out uh, Paul Levitt said okay to doing this podcast, I called you right away. Uh, very excited to let you know that this was actually happening, and couldn't have been a nicer guy. Uh, very open, talked about his career, his thoughts on big moments in DC history. Uh, so this is, this is going to be a really interesting episode for our, our listeners. Yeah, I've already he heard bits and pieces of this one, and uh, he's a really smart guy. Has a lot of great things to say about that uh, time in our life when we were growing up, uh, um, you know, um, uh, reading the comics, especially those big events like uh, Super Death of Superman, Batman breaking his back, and the infamous and not as well liked from Mr. Levitt's uh, Aquaman having his hand eaten and replaced with a hook. Kind of, kind of pales in comparison to That's the other two. Um, <laughs> you'll also hear what I find an interesting uh, little phrase from him talking about average comics that are not really have the impact. Processed lunch meat, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. And um, hopefully we're not going to be talking too much about processed lunch meat uh, on, on the podcast. But uh, Levitz was a great, great get for you guys and uh, looking forward to hearing more of it. Look, processed lunch meat has its place in lunch as well as comics, so let's not knock it. Hey, now, also, let's remind everyone to check out bcwsupplies.com. They have everything you need for your collecting needs, boxes, boards, uh, long boxes, short boxes, everything for collecting baseball cards, baseballs, footballs, etc. cetera. Uh, go to their website, bcwsupplies.com. Use promo code DBB, receive a 10% discount. We'll be really happy if you did that because, you know, they hook us up too. So I uh, hope everyone enjoys the podcast and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, today, uh, we are, I, I am super excited. I'm amazed and awe. Uh, I know Oren is as well. Uh, we have Paul Levitz, everyone. Thank you for joining us, sir. My pleasure, sir. Um, it's, it's, as you can see, I'm a huge Superman fan and DC <laughs> in general. Uh, you know, look, this is some of the stuff I have just in this corner of my, uh, yeah, okay, you beat me, but uh, <laughs> um, so I am going to uh, try not to, you know, just gush, but I'll, you know, get through this like a normal person. Uh, but first and foremost, I just would love to find out how and why you got into comics as a career. Well, kind of by accident. Um, I loved comics as a kid, along with science fiction, fantasy, many different kinds of books, detective stories. I was a very avid reader. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be born in Brooklyn at a moment when pretty much all the kids of my generation who were serious comic fans would get a chance to get into the comic book business. The... 95% or more of the working comics professionals were in the New York metro area in the 1970s when I was coming of age. The first generation guys were aging out fairly rapidly. So in the grand game of musical chairs, there were seats opening. And those of us who were standing at the edge with our tongues hanging out um, got an invitation to, come on inside kid, maybe you can do this. And you know, a lot of the kids came in 
hung around for a year and then ran in terror, said, nah, you know, I'm going to get the job my parents said I should try to do um, or something else that interests me more. Some kids didn't have anything much to offer in the process. They loved comics, but they didn't have any skill that would stick in the process or they landed in the wrong place at the wrong moment. And, uh, you know, I landed in the right place at the right moment. And uh, I figured I was going to get a real job afterwards. Comics was a declining world at that moment. But it started to turn around. I dropped out of college and said, all right, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll bet on this for a while. I've got enough money saved that I can go back if I need to. And I never needed to. And it's uh, almost 50 years later. Now, did you um, always want to be with DC specifically, or did you have, at least at the time, did you want to kind of move from uh, one company to another or, or anything? No, I grew up more on the DC books than the Marvel because they had a little better distribution in at least my portion of Brooklyn. I think it was probably all of Brooklyn at that point. Um, and my mom in particular had pretty strict limits on how many comics I could buy a week. Um, they were going to ruin my eyes. They certainly contributed to that wonderful process. Um, so I really didn't get a chance to get into Marvel until a little later on in the game. But I have the first 30 years of Marvel on, on my shelf. I, there's books there that I adore that I learned an awful lot from as a writer. A lot of my writing style descends from Stan Lee and Roy Thomas on their, uh, particularly the team books and the group books. Um, I mean, DC, DC happened to be the place where seat opened up first. The only time I was offered a staff job at Marvel, it would have required me dropping out of school before I was ready to, because I was able to do the DC job part-time. The Marvel thing would have been full-time. Um, and, you know, just, it worked out that way. No complaints. Uh, you know, over the years, I've had material published by probably as wide a range of comic book companies as any anybody who worked freelance over all the years. Um, I was being reminded a few minutes ago of my contribution to Fantagraphics back when it was Gary's fanzine back in uh, the early 1970s. Uh, but on up through you know, Eclipse, Star Reach, um, in more recent years, Dark Horse, Valiant. Um, and you know, it's, at some point, it would be wonderful if I get to do something at Marvel. Uh, you're, um, you know, the work that you were a part of and oversaw and, you know, contributed to was. Uh, was a lot of the the content and work that got me into comics to begin with and uh, it was visiting my Oren and another friend of ours uh, who read comics regularly at the time back in 92 ish around uh, and you know they got tired of me reading their their stuff and basically say can you just why don't you buy comics too and you know I ended up going with them but specifically it was death of Superman that got me into uh, comics which you know, mission accomplished uh you know it was uh basically and you know it was hearing all the buzz uh of the you know the uh, of that story on the news and whatnot that uh i was like wow really okay and then you know uh, harassing them and reading their comics about it um was that meant to i mean i know you know co characters have died and come back previously uh at that point, certainly. Superman certainly had. <laughs> well, that was a thing. I mean, was 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 it meant to be a and, and I've heard a lot of the, you know, the interviews and a lot of the kind of behind the scenes stuff from various DVDs and whatnot, but was it meant to be such a um a big thing? Because I know it was it was kind of just thrown out there the topic, well, let's just kill him. Um was no. it supposed to be such a big long event? It was supposed to be a story. Um, the media picked it up. Longtime comic fan named Harry Broges was working at the uh, Miami Herald 
as a reporter for many years, editor. I'm not sure exactly what Harry's title was in those days. He became aware of it early on. Um, we weren't keeping it an incredible secret in the process and wrote it up and it caught like wildfire. For the next year and change, we basically spent most of our time, I jokingly referred to it as, you know, catching manna and just trying to not let it slip through the baskets. Um, we spent a lot of time checking our print runs and doing second printings and other multiple printings and additional adjustments of different things to try and take advantage of it. But it was an incredible moment. Um, Superman is, is the great archetype of the superhero, right? It's where it all begins. And he's very deep in American culture somehow. It's been a long time since he's had the current grab that Batman has had several times in the last few decades. But there's a deep connection to him somewhere back there. You still see journalists writing up that, you know, this moment was this politician's kryptonite. Uh, you see the cultural references in songs, in journalism are just so deep, so constant. And the journalists were really the friends of that story. I mean, I think the Times wrote three different editorials about it. Um, when do you write an editorial about a comic book story? <laughs> <laughs> There's more important stuff going on in the world, guys. Uh, now, we have a friend that does that, actually. So <laughs> It's... I have a lot of journalist friends over the years, friends at the Times. We're certainly grateful to them for the publicity that we got. We're grateful to all the different outlets that gave us the publicity for that for that particular event. Um, but it grew. It, yeah. When you create things, whether it's new characters or new comics or storyline events, you have to believe in them. You have to think you're telling a decent story. Otherwise, it all comes out as processed lunch meat. Mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of what we published over the years was processed lunch meat. Let's be, let's be fair and be honest. Um, you know, if you're putting out 1,200 books a year, something like that, at peak of DC in my time, um, you're not going to get 1,200 glorious pieces of magic. Some of it will be, hopefully all of it will be professional and all of it, all of it entertains somebody. The comic guy might think it's the dumbest thing that we ever published and I'm not gonna single one out, but even that comic has somebody who really loved it. Yep. And you find that in a store in any conversation you have among fans, everybody has their own magic moment depending on how old they are, what mood they're yep. in, and what's going on in the gestalt of the, the world? What's, what's happening in the culture? And you put it out there, sometimes it clicks, sometimes nobody shows up and cares, and you really can't predict it. You just have to do your best job and hope that somebody notices that day. Yeah, it was, uh, sorry, Orrin, just wanted to say, like, you know, the, uh, and I'll move on from that stuff, I promise, but what, I will always remember uh, watching, I think it was one of the DVD extras on like a, the Death of Superman cartoon ad uh, adaptation that had come out. And, uh, you know, everyone that had contributed to the comic at the time was, you know, obviously interviewed and discussed it. And I believe it was, forgive me if I get the name wrong, because it has been a while, but Louise Simonson, who was discussing the whole thing. And she was getting emotional discussing it. And I was like, wow, you know, like I, I could, I could feel, you know, her emotion as she was describing what was, you know, the thought process and what was going into the character and the event and, and that whole thing. And that, uh, that always, you know, stuck with me, but yeah, it was, it was a huge moment for me. And it's one of those books that I always come back to. So uh, 
yeah. I also realized from the other side, Wheezy's a tremendously talented writer and editor. She'd been working in the field Twenty years by that point, maybe something like that. Um, very respected. All of a sudden, the world cares about what she does in a different fashion. And by the way, all of a sudden, she's picking up a royalty check that's got more digits than she's ever gotten before. Um, it's not like she's going to be hiring private jets or doing any. <laughs> Doing Richard, racing Richard Branson and uh, Jeff Bezos on a private spaceship. But for most of the people who worked on that project, it was the most profitable thing they had ever done. And that's great, right? These are, these are all solid professional people who contributed to the comics over the years. And Comics is a tough business to get rich in. It's a tough business to do really well in. Most of the people who work in it do it for a combination of love and, you know, thankfully it keeps a roof over my head. But when you have that kind of magic moment, it's got to be fabulous. Oh, yeah. I saw a news flash, I don't know, a month ago in this crazy new world of NFTs. Um, that Jose Delbo had seen a piece of his art on Wonder Woman get auctioned off for a million eight hundred thousand dollars as an NFT. Wow. And I don't know what portion of that Jose got to keep. I hope a meaningful percentage. I don't know if Jose earned a million eight hundred thousand dollars in any decade of his career or 20, 20 years of his career. He worked in comics for a very long time, very well. He, he drew some. He drew my few stories for Wonder Woman. Um, we worked on those together. He's a lovely human being. He, he was never anybody's number one hot artist of the week. He was a warrior. You know, you need the book done on time. The story will be told well. The characters will be reproduced faithfully. It will be an entertaining run. Jose's a good guy to call. Um, and here he's able to have a moment in the sun. And those moments are fabulous when creative people can get them because they don't happen. Just one quick follow-up I wanted to have is, at the time from where you were sitting, did you think the death of Superman and Batman having his back broken and to a lesser extent Aquaman losing his hand. Did you think these were necessary moments to move the character forward in the revolution? I have different feelings about the different stories. I was never a particular fan of Aquaman losing his hand. Um, my, just my vote as a reader, as much as a publisher. I think Mike Carlin, who was leading Superman in those years, Denny O'Neill, who was leading Batman, were really solid editors, as good editors as you get in this business. Uh, it's only two or three people I would put ahead of them on, on the all-time list. And they were serving the character. In Mike's case, he really felt Superman was being ignored. His team felt Superman was being undervalued at that time, and they wanted to do something big. Um, Denny felt that was a logical progression with Batman. And actually it is kind of true to the character. I'm reminded that, I'm gonna mangle the pronunciation. There's a science called kinesthesiology, basically the study of muscles and motion. And a professor of that did a thorough analysis of Batman and said, you know what? You actually could be trained to do the set of things to do most of what Batman does, you could probably do it for about a year. At the end of that, you'd be somewhere between Jello and a cripple. <laughs> um, but you could do it for about a year uh, if you were prop proper properly trained over a very long period of time. Well, Batman breaking his back isn't shocking. He's human, and if with a career like his, yeah, that's. 
that's sort of bound to happen at some point in it. The recovery is not very realistic, but we didn't. These are comic books. We don't have to be that. Realistic. <laughs> you have to go through a little detail. <laughs> Sadly enough, I could probably break my back too, just walking around the house after my kids. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> whole other, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Uh, so I was curious, you know, during your, your time at, at DC, uh, you were a part of, you know, bringing in some really fabulous talent, uh, such as uh, Alan Moore, George Perez, John Byrne, uh, among others. When uh, did you see something in them, um, you know, that they were going to be huge or you knew they had like an it factor when you when you brought them in or they were just like they have a talent and we're going to let them run. Well, I was very rarely the sole person involved in any of that. Okay. And in most of those cases, the people were already doing interesting work somewhere. You know, John had started off in fandom. He was doing some body of work for Charlton as a young artist. He was beginning to do interesting stuff at Marvel by the time I think his work for me on Untold Legend of the Batman was his first DC work. Uh, unfortunately, we had scheduling problems, so he wasn't able to do the whole series. But um, by the time we brought him on to do Superman, he was already a star artist. George, I, George, I know from fanzines back when we were kids. Uh, he did he did art for one of my friends' fanzines, I think probably when he was 16 or 17, um, maybe younger. But again, he broke in elsewhere. He broke in primarily at Marvel. And by the time we brought him over, this wasn't brain surgery. This guy had already proved he was incredible. Alan Moore is a little more interesting. I mean, I came home to my apartment one evening to the open the mail and there's a letter that says, Hi, I'm the best comics writer in England, even though you don't know who I am. And I'm sending you this because I think you're one of the better comic writers in America. And if you ever need anybody to write The Martian Manhunter, please, please give me a call. Um, Len Wein and I debated for any number of years which of us first said maybe, he could use, maybe he'd be a good guy to put on Swamp Thing. <laughs> Len believed he did. Len's memory was much better than mine generally, and Len was the actual editor. Um, but... A couple of us were aware of the Brits, were paying attention to 2000 AD, where so much interesting work was being done at that moment. And, you know, you fall in love with the different pieces. You, you don't know how the audience is going to respond. You don't know where the journey is going to take it. Certainly, Alan hadn't done anything for 2000 AD remotely as groundbreaking as the work he would do on Swamp Thing or on Watchmen. Be for Vendetta. But uh, he certainly already demonstrated that he could write. I, I want to speak a little bit about talent because a uh, young writer at a time got to work with Steve Ditko and Wally Wood on this book. Did you get to, to handpick these two? Or <laughs> God, I was 17 years old. The only thing I could pick was my nose. That's crazy. Like, you're 17 <laughs> and you're working... I, I want to know, because Steve Dicko now has gotten this air of mystery about him. You know, he's a, a, almost a mythical character. At the time, was he just a, a guy who used to work in Marvel who did Spider-Man and now you got to work with him? Or was there that that mysterious vibe about him at the time, too? Steve, you know, I, I, don't, I don't talk about Steve's personality much because he preferred to have his work speak for him. Right. And I think I think those of us who knew him and who were friendly with him should respect that. Gotcha. Uh, but a lot of a, a lot of it is overstated, and you know, artists artists are interesting human beings. Right. Writers are interesting human beings. Good creative people tend to be a little abnormal in some fashion or another. Um, I tended to forgive myself that I never rose to the top of the tree as a creative person because I was maybe a little too normal. Um, but he was just, he was a brilliant artist yeah. to be paired with. But 
as a Harmine, Harmine had decided that Conan was a success and there was room for DC to get into that niche. And he walked down the hall and basically said to different editors, uh, you're doing one new sword and sorcery book, you're doing two and you're, you're two months late because we're putting them on the schedule retroactively. Yeah. And I was Joe Orlando's assistant. Uh, and he asked Joe for a couple of new sword and sorcery books that were already late. And I said, me, Joe, me, please, me, can I do one? And he said, you know, we'll go home and come back with a pitch. And I came in the next day with uh, probably a one page typed pitch. We weren't, we weren't into the develop a, a complicated Bible stage of comics yet. And it, I guess it was adequate. Mm -hmm. So I got the chance. He, he, he was working a little bit with Ditko on some mystery stories at that point. Woody, of course, was his old partner in crime for many years before at EC, and he was trying to get Woody more work at DC. So I, you know, I, I land in gold. <laughs> it's, uh, it's absurd. I would say, as a, a young writer, how big was it for you to be able to not take someone else's character, but kind of create your own as far as, you know, your writing development? You know, I think when you're that age, you don't know what the hell anything is as a big thing. Um, you know, looking back, I find the whole experience amazing that I got away with it. <laughs> um, at the time, it was just, well, you know, David's coming up with Claw and Michael's doing Beowulf. And okay, so I guess I can do Stalker. Um, it didn't, it wasn't unusual because it wasn't, it wasn't unusual for us, right? That's that's the place we were in, the moment we were in. Right. And uh, we got to do some st stuff like that. Uh, very little of it had lasting impact because the shape the industry was in at the time and none of us were so brilliant that we could create the grand game-changing thing. But boy, it was fun. <laughs> and there's one question that I, I've been dying to ask you just because we spoke of Dicko for a second, but I want to talk for a minute about Jack Kirby because when he jumped to uh, DC, they put him on uh, Jimmy Olsen, and then later on he moved to, you know, creating the fourth world and stuff. Um, if you were in charge at the time from your, you know, years of experience looking back, Jack Kirby signs with DC. How would you have handled him coming into the company? What, what would your plan for him have been? I, I mean, I think, I don't think there was a lot of choice in that. I think Carmine did pretty much exactly what was possible. Jack didn't want to take a book away from anybody. Um, sweet, sweet man. And Jimmy Olsen was, I guess, one of the weakest sellers at that moment and didn't have a regular artist of note attached to it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, I think Pete Costanza may have done the last work on it and either was done working at DC for one reason or another, yeah. but it may have literally been an open assignment. And Carmine let Jack do the fourth world. The two debatable decisions, three debatable decisions in that period that I would love to have had a time machine to go change if, if I had the power to go back were the relatively trivial but offensive decision of having a couple of guys redraw some of Jack's Superman heads on some of the early work. I don't think it, a, I don't think it accomplished anything and B, it pissed Jack off needlessly. Right. Um, doing a deal with Vinny Paletta to ink Jack's fourth world stuff, which was ultimately bad casting and a bad deal. Um, and then the decision to cancel the fourth world books, I think prematurely, because they were selling okay. They weren't selling phenomenally. Right. And Carmine was really betting that Jack would be a, a turnaround engine for DC, having done so much so powerfully for Marvel. Um, but it would have been great if Jack had been able to complete those stories in the natural order that he wanted to. I was going to say, have, 
because you when you've been in these positions there's got to be a lot of stress that comes with sometimes having to have those tough conversations with you know legendary people or even young folks coming up how did you handle the stress of the job you know the toughest part of the jobs that i've had over the years was when i was managing the freelancers um i could go into a business negotiation and take a million dollars out of somebody's pocket and we'd shake hands at the end of it and stay friends and go on on for that if there's three guys who want to write batman and there's only one batman book available they all believe they've got the right thing to say or they want it the most and two of them are really going to be pissed so that was a, and a lot of them were friends of mine uh, so that was a that was a that was a tough job period and i wasn't very old and experienced maybe i'd have been better at it if i had had that job in my late 20s or my early 30s rather than in my in my teens yeah i was going to say that's that's absolutely incredible that at that age to be in that position uh it's it's a credit to you as they found such value in you that they felt that this is a, a someone who can really be a benefit to the company there wasn't a lot of value placed on dc comics as a company okay. by, by its parents uh, it was something that they had bought early on before they bought warner brothers they bought it with a bunch of other stuff the other stuff made more money than DC did. Bill Gaines made more money with his 12 person staff on Mad Magazine by far than we did with DC Comics in those years. Um, and was valued, and he was valued appropriately within that. I got a lot of job freedom at a couple of jobs early in my career that are bizarre looking back at it but a lot of it was, you know, somebody's got to do it. The kid knows something. He works hard. He's here. Um, you know, we get along with him. Let Paul do it. You know, it wasn't quite the level of let Mikey eat the life cereal. But, uh, it wasn't, it, it wasn't recognizing genius. Um, <laughs> We, we recognize genius. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> I, did all the job, I did all the jobs well enough that I got to keep them for a very long time. So I can't have screwed up too badly in the process. I was going to say. I mean, you have a very, I mean, there are not many people, uh, at least that I'm aware of. And, you know, we've been obviously researching this and, you know, been a part of, you know, trying to delve as far as we can into the, the uh, the world of comics behind the the scenes, as you say, um, and there's not too many people uh, who have had such longevity uh, in the, in that business as you. I mean, you know, there are a few, but I mean, not certainly not from such a young age and just progressing, you know, as far and up the ladder as you did. I got to sit at sort of the head table of the industry for probably more years than anyone who wasn't a donor. And there are people who founded companies and owned them who held on to control for longer periods of time. Not many, but a few. Um, but out of, a, out of a class of hired help, um, I was... I was in an important role in the field for more years, maybe than any other hired help. Um, I don't know what I don't know what that qualifies for as a distinction, but uh, but again, it was fun. You know, yeah. I got I got to have an amazing job or succession of jobs that played with things that I had loved since I was a child. Got to learn about so many different industries in so many different ways because. The nature of Superman and Batman connected you to so many different things. Okay, this afternoon I have to understand the toy industry. Tomorrow I've got to understand about the T-shirt you're wearing and how that gets licensed, how that gets sold. Where, what's the difference between being in Target and being in Walmart, and who's the who's the best company for doing business in that? Um, 
Tomorrow I've got to understand printing. I've got to understand distribution. Now I've got to work on a movie contract. Now I've got to work with a movie writer or director. Um, well, it was wonderful for somebody with a short attention span. <laughs> Uh, it, going back to the comics specifically, though, and the, the 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 books that you worked on, whether it's you know Legion or Superman, Batman, um, was there something or an element that you wanted to bring to these to these books and characters that hadn't been there previously? Did you want to, you know, what was your goal for them? Get them done, get paid, and entertain people. Um, Fair enough. All right. <laughs> If you read my material, it's not hard to figure out my politics. I don't mean about voting Democratic or voting Republican. Mm -hmm. Probably not too hard to figure that out either. Um, but in terms of politics, in terms of my, my view of how the world ought to operate. Um, and I think that's true of most writers. Mm -hmm. you, you bring to your work who you are, what your life experience is, how you see the world. And at different times in my career, I had different opportunities. The, the Legion in the 1980s in particular was an opportunity to really make the stories a little bit deeper, a little bit more complex because the audience was older. We were selling primarily now to the kids who were coming into comic shops who were generally 12 and up instead of up to 12. So can I change them? Can I make it work for that audience? Can I do the kinds of stories that will play well? And I, that was probably the most successful writing work I've ever done. Um, there's rarely a giant agenda, I think, for most writers. It comes from within you. What do you, what do you want to, what story do you want to tell today? And in the days I did most of my writing, did most of my writing as assignment writing. And one day, Julie Schwartz says, you want to write a few Lois Lane stories for Superman Family? I've not sat there my whole life and said, can I write a Lois Lane story, sir? Um, but sure, I can write a Lois Lane story. She's an potentially interesting character. Right. Um, there were assignments that you approached with more of an agenda. Sometimes it showed, sometimes it didn't. I was, for a while in the 70s, regarded at DC as one of the better writers of strong female characters. And Jeanette Kahn, during that time, asked me to take on writing Wonder Woman. I thought about Wonder Woman. I read more of the old material than I had previously read. I said, well, you know, the magic of this character, the essence of this character is this is the only one of the great heroes who gave up immortality to be human. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. I can't find a trace of it in the stories I wrote. Uh, I ran off the series after four and a half issues because I could feel that it wasn't working. Was that all me that was failing? Was it some combination of me and the editor? Ross Andrew is a very talented man. Not, a, not an editor for a great portion of his career, but certainly a supportive one. Jose Delbo, who I mentioned before, was drawing the book at the time. I don't think it's Jose's fault. I just, I may have had an agenda, but I can't find it. Um, you're welcome to take a look at those issues, though I'd rather you didn't, um, <laughs> and see if you can find it. So what worked on Legion, though? What connected there so much with you? They were characters I loved since I was a kid. It was the first series I seriously collected. Um, I had made paper dolls of them. I had made creepy crawler plastic figures of them in the days before there were action figures. Uh, I cared about the ballad. I understood them deeply. And the type of book it was, that large team structure, is something I very much loved as a reader. And the advantage of it, you know, if you're writing Superman, even if you kill Lois, you know she'll be back next month, particularly in those years. 
these years maybe maybe she'll come back as a zombie maybe something else <laughs> it, it <could> be that. <laughs> you're essentially playing in a zero-sum universe you can introduce a new character and screw with their life but they're going to have a little label on them that says i'm a new character they may be going to do something here <laughs> From back when I was a kid, you could take characters that people really cared about and kill them, marry them, change their lives, change their powers, boss them out of the group. That enabled a very different kind of story to be told. Aaron Berger used to say that I was writing soap opera more than I was writing soup operas. Um, well, maybe it was both. But um, the ability to really get into the characters' lives, I think, is what people cared about in the work. Did you feel any pressure, though, because, it, like you said, it was a book that you grew up reading, to put, you know, sort of keep it modern, to put your spin on it, but also to keep sort of the homage to, you know, the characters and how they came about and how they were created? Did you feel any pressure to stay within certain boundaries while writing for that? I wouldn't describe it as pressure because that implies it's from outside, but I grew up on, I grew up on that stuff. It was fun to work with what had been previously established and to find the loopholes in it and the ways to work within it. That was part of making the puzzle work. Makes sense. Um, and, you know, your, your long career, uh, was there any character that you wanted to really sink your teeth into that you just, for whatever reason, didn't get around to doing so? I think of the, of the DC characters, Green Lantern is probably the one that I would have enjoyed doing the run on that I never got a chance to. The space opera of it. Doc Smith's Lensman series of novels, which is where the modern Green Lantern was knocked off from, is a series of books that I loved and I've gone back to reread any number of times in my life. Um, but I, and I, you know, I got to edit Batman for three years. I got to write Superman as a newspaper strip for a couple of years, as well as writing a bunch of DC Presents and occasional solo stories within the Superman universe. Um, as I say, I got to write Wonder Woman really badly. Uh, Flash was never a particular thing I loved at any given point. Um, I got to write the JSA. I love the, the old JLA JSA stories. Yeah. Love them better than I love the regular JLA stories. Um, I got to do an awful lot of the DC stuff that I would love. I never got to play with the Marvel characters though. So I've been, you know, great fan of the the Avengers up through Stan and Roy's work. Great fan of the X Men uh, in its earlier incarnations. Um, yeah, maybe someday. You know, there is uh, as you're talking. There, there was uh, since you mentioned JSA, uh, Earth Two, I believe, was something that you were a part of. Um, that from a couple few years back and that was a fantastic just series uh i was really i mean now i guess everything is you know everything counts everything is a part of the multiverse and various versions and whatnot <laughs> but um that's their world guys yeah <laughs> I really liked Earth Two. That's basically what I'm. What it boils down to, it was a great series that uh, I don't hear much. I don't think gets enough recognition. But sorry. <laughs> you know, part of, the, part of the challenge for things to get recognized in this field, they need to live for a while. It's it's very rare that you have something of the artistic level of a Watchman that comes and goes in a year mm -hmm. and the world still cares about it 30 odd years later. Um, that's part of why, uh, we why we recognize it as real art, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was, 
I think certainly as of now with uh, you know current events and whatnot, it's it was it was pivotal at the time because it it took Alan Scott reinvented him, and you know he was now he's you know uh, he's a homosexual hero, which is you know and now is you know a big part of the the culture and part of the advertising um, when you know they're promoting you know, uh, you know, LGBTQ and whatnot. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty pivotal in that sense. The world is a better place than it was when I did most of my comic book writing. When I got into the comic book industry, there were no out homosexuals in the field. The best research that uh, Andy Mangles, who's probably the, most informed guy on the subject has done indicates that Duffy, Duffy Volan, who was a friend and a comic fan of my generation, was the first out gay man in comics when he was working in Marvel. Um, and that's probably the mid 1970s, maybe yeah, even a little earlier, sort of the, the early mid 1970s. I had no idea that Duffy was gay. My, my, gay, my gaydar is pretty awful in general. I mean, as a young kid, I was particularly oblivious to many, many things about it, uh, including that. But it's a more diverse, more accepting world, at least in a lot of good places. There's yep. still a lot of places with a lot of challenges. We're seeing now in so many ways, a division in the American society and the American culture between the places that are accepting and that are getting the benefit of the diverse society and the places that are striving desperately to pull the covers over their head and say, can it be 1955 now? I really like 1955. <laughs> it's a rough challenge. I remember a conversation I had when we did the Green Lantern story that was uh, influenced by the Matthew Shepard killing. Oh yeah. And a phone call came through to the office and got through to my desk, I don't remember how it got bounced to me. A father, it was much more upset than angry. I love these characters. I want to share these characters with my kids and I can't share them with my kids because you're putting this material into the books. Well, sir, I support your right to decide what your kids read. I think that's a very important thing for parents to manage and to pay attention to. And I'm glad you love the characters but you probably shouldn't be giving them our comics to read if you feel this way, because we're gonna to continue to put a full range of the human experience in the book. And it was a tough conversation because this was not a, not a horrible human being, mm -hmm. whether he'd been brought up in a particularly closed-minded environment or he'd come to what I regard as unfortunate conclusions about what the life ought to be. But he was trying to deal with, deal with a world that was changing that he didn't want to change around him. And we're at a very challenging point in this country right now because of that. And you're seeing it. And I think, sadly, we're going to see that in a very kind of frightening way over the next six months with what's going on with the vaccine. dissonance between different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. and you're seeing people, there's groups of people out there who are uncomfortable with science. And there's groups of people who are sitting here thanking God for the science. This, this past year, been in many ways, the, 
most significant miracle we've had out of science in my lifetime, that they were able to pull off developing the vaccine in this amount of time. Yes, they had previously worked on similar vaccines. They had a lot of previous information. It's not like, it's not like a stroke of genius from scratch. But the scientific people of the world were sharing information. We're saying, look, we have to do something. Can we do it this way? Can we do it that way? How can we do it quickly? Not all of the vaccines are equally effective. Uh, there's some significant debate about the, the ones that are being widely supported in China and Russia at this point. There have been some challenges with some of them, with the uh, blood clot problems and things like that. I don't think they're all perfect, unmixed blessings. But dear God, how many lives have been saved so far and how much progress we're making getting back to normal. And yet there's still pockets of people who are saying, you know, I'm not going to trust it. I don't know. There's some weird stuff going on. Yeah. Well, well, that's, I'll concede that it's weird, but this is the best kind of weird. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a science fiction fan, so I like the best kind of weird. Uh, I, I, I would be curious to know, out of, you know, your entire career, what would you, what are you the most proud of or what you want to be, what would you want to be remembered for the most? I don't know that I can be remembered for the things I'm most proud of. Um, this is, people care much more about creative content than they do about business process. And, you know, I, most readers, most comic book fans, if they remember me, are more likely to remember me for the Great Darkness Saga than anything I did in the business side of the company. Um, but I think my more lasting effects, I'm really proud of having written the first standard written contracts for talent in this field. Um, we had fairly barbaric business practices before that. And it wasn't a perfect contract, wasn't a perfect set up on any level, but it was a radical step forward in a troubled business. I'm really proud of having been part of the team that developed the first standard royalty plans for the business. I think it's the secret of why the 80s were as fertile of creative time and comics as they were is that royalties came into effect. And that changed the behavior of the creative people it gave them incentive to bet on themselves and to really put their best foot forward. Uh, I'm very proud of the work I did over a longer stretch of time, helping popularize the trade paperback format for the graphic novel, which is one of the real standards of the field right now. Yeah. A lot of this stuff doesn't sound bite as easily. I think I was a significant supporter of the comic shop market from my earliest days as a house fan at DC when Saul Harrison came out and said, so Phil Suling just gave me this pitch for this thing called uh, direct sales. Um, do you think it makes any sense, Paul? Um, yeah, so I think it's, you know, it's not a lot of these comic shops, but I think they're a good thing. Um, you know, through what I was able to do in, as in a business leadership role, helping to build that market. Um, I'll be remembered for what I'll be remembered for if I'll be remembered at all. But I'm really pleased that at least some of the body of creative work I did has endured. I'm delighted that people still read things that I wrote decades ago. Um, very proud of the body of my work. And some of it's better than others. But overall, I'll hold it up. I'll hold it up against any of the guys of my generation. Um, and I think we ran a great company. I think in any industry you look at today, the disruptors, the agents of change are almost always the upstart brand new companies run by some crazy entrepreneur. And often those are terrifically important businesses. But generally, if you ask 
who the oldest company in the business is, the most corporately owned one, they ain't the innovator. And if you look back at DC Comics in the years when Jeanette Kahn, Joe Orlando, Dick Giordano, and I were the center of the management team, and there were other people who certainly deserve much of the credit too. Um, in those years, I think we can fairly claim that despite being the oldest, despite being the most corporately owned, we were the most innovative company in the business. And we innovated in a way that was ultimately good for all our stakeholders. It was good for our readers. It was good for our creative people. It was good for our retail and distribution partners. It made the business a better place. In many ways, it was good for our competitors. And that's how, that's how you look at something and say you've done a good job. Totally agree. I have, I want to comment of your time, I just have one more question for you, speaking of your competitors, just because you were around 1970s, Marvel, you guys have Superman, Batman, one of the most famous superhero characters ever. Marvel has Stan Lee. Stan Lee's going on talk shows. Stan Lee's going in a magazine and stuff like that. Was there ever a push inside DC to, to move someone up as sort of a figurehead to be like, okay, you have Stan Lee, this will be our guy to do the talk shows, to, to go out with the fans, to, you know, spread the word of DC, or did you rely, we have the best characters, this is what's, this is our selling point? Well, remember that Stan chose that path for himself. Yes. It, it wasn't that the company said, we need a spokesperson. He did it brilliantly. He was great for comics that way. Um, so if you look at the leadership of DC, when I was a kid and got there, Carmine Infantino was running it, who's a brilliant artist, did some innovative things editorially, was not a fabulous public speaker or public figure. The next time we really had a clear leader was Jeanette Kahn, who was a ter and is brilliant and a terrific speaker and a terrific public figure. And she started to get a fair amount of publicity in the 80s. Um, but her focus was not about comics in the same way that Stan's was. Stan was the writer. He was the, he was doing it himself. Jeanette was the business leader. So she could be the cover story in Savvy Magazine about, isn't it cool that a young woman is getting to do this? And when you looked around the table of the people who were working together for those years, There certainly wasn't someone with Stan's ability to be a public figure. And there wasn't someone with Stan's connection to the material. Jeanette is the closest we would have been able to have to it. Uh, Dick Giordano had a lifelong set of hearing problems that made it very hard for him to be in a public capacity and was not, not a phenomenal public speaker, he was a decent public speaker. I was a snotty kid. Um, I didn't have the gravitas, the credentials, or the, the persona to do something like that. Um, to the extent I became a good public speaker, it was o over many years, and I certainly never had the connection to the material that Stan did or the creative ownership of the company in that fashion. So you may, it doesn't re matter. And then there was a long period of the company's existence when the parent company, Warner Brothers, um, had a corporate, political, philosophical approach that said, we don't want any of our division leaders to be public figures. The heads of, the, the heads of Warner Brothers are the public spokespeople for all of Warner Brothers. And we don't want the head of Warner Brothers movies or the head of Warner Brothers TV or the head, much less the head of DC Comics to be getting, be getting articles in the New York Times about them. And that lasted from about 1989 for us to 
the beginning of the the beginning of the 21st century. So probably a, probably about a 12 year period, which also was the period when probably it would have been easiest for DC to take a public position. How frustrating for you to to, to know that that because it seems like when Warner Brothers came in, like you said, they looked at you guys as an asset, just one of many things that they you know owned. Did you feel like they you know could have done a lot more for you guys? We had great bosses. Right. We had we had lots of weaponry given to us. Lots of resources that were given to us. We were treated extraordinarily well, both as executives and as the staff. Um, if we could come up with a good reason to invest in the business, we could get the resources. I spent several years trying to, burning through ad agencies, trying to figure out an intelligent way to use advertising to get more people to read comics. Not because we went with that saying we want to do it, because our then boss at Warner Brothers came out of the advertising industry, by named Sandy Reisenbach. He said, you should try this. You know, Paul, you know, advertising works. How come you guys can't do it? <laughs> um, and we went through four or three agencies and lots, lots of money was available to us, except we kept doing the research and the analysis and came back to, yeah, we can spend, spend some dollars and get something to happen, but for every dollar you spend, you're going to lose two. Um, okay, this is maybe not such a great idea. Right? Makes sense. Uh, you know, every boss you've got, every owner you've got is imperfect. Because we're in an imperfect world. Overall, DC benefited enormously in the years that I was there from the bosses we had and the ownership we had behind us. Certainly compared to Marvel in those years, which went through one disastrous ownership after another, it was causing one internal political problem or the bankruptcy or all, all sorts of mess. Yeah. Um, we had, we were much luckier. Um, could it have been better? Sure, I'm sure it could have been better. Yeah. But uh, not plausible. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. Well, you talked about what you're being remembered for, and I'm I'm just going to hold this up. Uh, you're going to be remembered in my house because you signed this for me, along with everyone else, at a comic book shop up in our neck of the woods, and the other version as well, which uh, you guys were kind enough to uh, address to her, uh, uh, to write to my uh, my son, who was four, three or four at the time. So, uh, you know, I don't have very many signed items. This is one of them. So I, I treasure this. Um, that was up in Hawthorne, right? Uh, it was in Harrison. 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 Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was it was great. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I don't I don't get out to the comic book shops as as much as I'd like to. But I was come hell or high water. I was going to be there for this one. So it, it was great for me. And my son was a part of it too, which was even more yeah. spectacular. Of course, he didn't appreciate waiting in the lines and all that. But <laughs> Come on. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get it yet. But <laughs> at any rate, uh, I want to thank you um, for kind of everything you've done. <laughs> Not just the t for taking the time out of your your day and your schedule to be here to talk to us, uh, but you know for your career and all your contributions. It's been it's it's fantastic. I mean, we really appreciate it. Look, you guys let me get away with it. <laughs> you paid my you paid my mortgage. Yes. I, I mean if I turn the camera around, you can see all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> my wife appreciates it too. <laughs> I appreciate her patience. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, that being said, uh, everyone, uh, you know, please like, subscribe, please leave comments, questions, what have you. Uh the amazing Paul Levitz, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. you. Have a good July 4th. Thank you. You too. Hey, well, that was our interview with Paul Levitz. I want to thank Paul Levitz for uh, taking the time to talk to us. That was uh, an absolute dream and a thrill to talk to him. To talk to the guy that was pivotal and instrumental in some of my favorite comic book moments. It's absolutely, absolutely a pleasure.
And of course, you know, if you want to talk to us, what are your thoughts on things, find us on Facebook with our page, Dollar Bin Bandits, or go to YouTube. We have a page there too. It's Dollar Bin Bandits, all one word. Awesome. And of course, we want your feedback. We want to hear from you. Uh, we want this podcast uh, to succeed and be all up in the top of the charts. So please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And uh, I think we're, we're done, guys. What do you think? It's been great. There's our first podcast in the can. Yeah. We'll see Exciting. you next week. We've got a lot coming up. So uh, we'll see you next week. We out. Yeah.